at home and abroad. Today we have a usual update. We are in the middle of the 28 day period that we spoke about last time we met. As you may recall, the last time we met, we gave you an update. On the 17th of August, we had a, a spike that caused us to adjust our position. It has always been the policy of the government of Trinidad and Tobago in managing this virus that we will take the best decisions at every stage. And if we have to adjust, we adjust. We are wedded or cemented to no position for politics or personal agenda. The national agenda is what prevails. So we get a lot of advice. Um, yesterday we were getting a lot of advice about how we should move aggressively against this virus. I simply want to alert the population that it is the same virus requiring nothing other than the attention of the government of Trinidad and Tobago. And we, that the advice we get, we don't dismiss any, but we usually take the ones that are in the best interest. So we didn't declare a state of emergency. We didn't leave the bars open. We didn't leave the border open. And we didn't wait on the sunshine. We have been making the adjustments based on the scientific data and the response of the population. So today, I would like to ask the CMO or the minister first. You want to go first, minister? Yes, yes sir. We'll ask minister to go first, give us a status, then we'll get all the technical nuances from CMO and his team, and then I will tell you where we're at in response to what we would learn in the next few minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Prime Minister. Good afternoon to ladies and gentlemen of the media and to all citizens and all persons listening in. Um, you may recall that we always said that we were trying to maintain our hospital capacity at 75% or less. Whenever we felt that things were going above 75%, that would be an uncomfortable position to be in. Before we took recent action, Cora's maximum uh, occupancy had reached 63% at one time. Coover also reached about 63%. Augustus Long reached 14%, and Arima reached 40%. So although we never reached 75%, we knew that if we did not take measures, we would reach there and then precipitate a crisis, and the curve would not be flattened. When we announced the escalation plan, which we had, on Wednesday, I could tell you now that Cora's occupancy is now 13%. Coover is about 30%. Augustus Long remains at 14%. And Arima has only gone down slightly to 38%. So overall, right now, we have a 24% occupancy of beds in the hospital system. That is separate from quarantine and step down. So although we never reached 75, if we did not take action, we would have reached there. But right now, as I said, all the numbers have come down. When we announced the escalation plans on Wednesday, we looked at the geography throughout Trinidad and Tobago. We looked at the socioeconomic conditions prevailing and I'm happy to announce two refinements to the escalation plan. The CMO will go into the technical details. I will just announce the policy positions. We had a meeting with the CMOHs on Thursday, and what we have announced to them, and I'm announcing it to the national community now, is that in Trinidad, any individual, because of socioeconomic or spatial criteria, meaning you have a positive case which is now allowed to self-quarantine at home. So for instance, you have somebody living in a, in a small apartment with, with five and six people with only one bathroom. It is difficult for that person to really self-quarantine at home. We are now offering those persons the option via the CMOHs to voluntarily come in to state-supervised state quarantine. And I think that's a very positive development so anyone 
who because of socio-spatial conditions at home, you live in a house with too many people, there's one shared bathroom, um, you're sleeping four to a room, you can't separate yourselves. We are how, now have that refinement where you could come in voluntarily and we urge you, we urge you and you will be quarantined in our facilities again free of charge. The other refinement we have made based on geography and the CMO will go into details is that to deal with Tobago. Because of Tobago's unique geography and the small number of cases that they currently have, Tobago will maintain for the time being until numbers change will maintain for their time being their state supervised use of all facilities across the healthcare spectrum, from quarantine to step down to hospitals. Both the Prime Minister and myself have been in talks with the Secretary of Health. Uh, they have asked for this and we are happy to um, comply with them based on the fact that they have a unique geography, small population, and a fewer number of cases at this time. But that policy may change if the numbers determine at some future date. So those are the two refinements we have made to the policy, to the escalation policy, which we announced on Wednesday. And I think they have gone down well with the population so far. So thank you, Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Minister Dalsing. I would now ask CMO to take us through the day's report and this week's report and the analysis of our bar charts and curves. Okay. So thank you, Prime Minister, Honorable Ministers, members of the media, members of the viewing and listening public. We start with the daily summary. So the daily summary for today, Saturday, August 29th, 2020, is as follows. So the total number of samples submitted to all our labs, Caribbean Public Health Agency, UWI, North Central, 22,987. Number of unique patients tests completed, 20,065. Number of repeated tests, 2,922. Number of samples which tested positive from, the, from March 12 to present, 1,577. Total number of active cases are now at 894. Number of deaths due to COVID-19, 19. 19. Number of persons discharged, 664. Between 4 p.m. yesterday and 8 a.m. this morning, we had an additional 23 persons testing positive, which takes our number up to 1577. At our different facilities, as Minister would, in, in, would have indicated the, the percentages, the numbers are as follows. We have positive patients, 76 in the hospitals. At the Coover Hospital and Multi-Training Facility, there are 63 persons, 6 of those are in ICU, 10 at the High Dependency Unit. At the Cora Hospital, there are 13 persons. Within our step-down facilities, as you would have noted a few days ago with the change in discharge, we were able to get out 402 persons over a couple of days. So now at the Brooklyn facility, we have no one. At the Belandra facility, there are 2 persons. Takarigua, 2 persons. UE Deby, 3 individuals. UE Canada Hall, no individuals at this time. UE Freedom Hall, there are no persons at this time. At the Napa, which is for healthcare workers, is now a step-down facility. There are three individuals. As it relates to what Minister alluded to in terms of the discharge criteria, there is a little bit of confusion, I think, after the announcements were made. So just let me attempt to clarify what the discharge criteria remains for quarantined individuals and the discharge criteria for isolated individuals. So the difference being... A person that is quarantined is someone that would have had exposure to a suspected or confirmed case of COVID-19. So it remains for primary contact 14 days from your date of exposure going forward. It doesn't matter if you have a negative test at that point. If you are primary contact of a case, you still have to have 14 days of quarantine. So quarantine is for exposure. It is not for positive patients. Isolation is really as it relates to persons that are positive. So we would have had a change in the criteria from hospital hospitalization for all positive cases to home quarantine for mild cases, moderate and severe cases go to hospital. So as you have seen from the numbers, we have decreased the occupancy of both Kuva and Cora and the step down. And this is really anticipating that hospitals should be kept for moderately and severely ill patients. 
What we had before is we had a number of mild cases in the hospital, then we would have stepped them down to a step-down facility. So now we have basically persons in the hospital and we have room for persons that might be moderately or severely ill. In the step-down facilities, if persons have to come in, based on the criteria minister described, they will be mild individuals as well. So in terms of our discharge criteria for home isolation, which is slightly different, and it does apply to hospital as well, for persons that have symptoms, we are looking at a minimum of 10 days after the onset of your symptoms. So from the date your symptoms begin, we count 10 days from that point. If your symptoms are less than 10 days, then we're looking for an additional three days of absolutely no symptoms. You have no fevers, you have no respiratory symptoms, you have no symptoms at all. And in addition to that, we have added on, which is a little addition to the WHO criteria, seven additional days. So the seven additional days where we got it from, in the first wave of our, our uh, phase one, when we did our discharge criteria, two negatives. What we found when we did the analysis is that the majority of persons would have gotten their first negative at around day six. So in keeping with having a negative individual, we have added seven days to your discharge criteria to ensure that persons are no longer transmissible at the time of leaving either home quarantine or hospital quarantine. In terms of asymptomatic cases, we are, our 10 days begin from the date of your positive test. We don't have the three days additionally for asymptomatic because you would have had no symptoms throughout. So we add seven days to that to ensure that there's no transmissibility. So those are our discharge criteria for both quarantine and home isolated patients. In terms of the general epidemic, we have seen the great, what we have done, the numbers, as you know, that we release on a daily basis are usually a group of reports that, that go back a, a week or so. So we would have seen maybe yesterday or today reports generated from the period 21st to the 28th. So, so it includes reports all the way back from the 21st to the 28th. In terms of disaggregation of the epidemiological curve, what we have noted so far, and the dates be before the 21st going forward, our epidemiological curve has so far shown the highest level to be 72 for any one given day based on the date of sampling and that occurred on around the 16th of 17th of August. After that we saw a small decrease for the next four days which gives us going down to 53, 35, that sort of number per day and we hope that that trend continues with the measures that we have put in place but of course we can't tell off unless we get the samples completed for this period. So the curve that we are generating has a lag of about a week in it that we'll keep looking at, but we saw a small decrease over the period 17 to the 22nd, and our testing now is occurring between the 22nd and the 28th. So once that is populated, in about a week's time, we'll see what happens over those days. So basically, we are weak lag in terms of the way we can see what is happening to the epidemic, but judging from those four days, we saw a small decline from the 17th to the 22nd. So Prime Minister, that's my clinical update for this morning. Thank you very much, Dr. Paraswam. Uh, it brings me to a little review of what we're dealing with. We have been paying attention to and responding to this virus roughly from early January, would say. We first heard about it in November. It became an epidemic then a pandemic bit later on. I simply want to say to the national community that our system is working and we should not allow misinformation, panic, or unreasonable conduct to allow us not to be able to coexist with a virus which is becoming better and better known. We have been engaged in our since eight months in responding to this, and by we I mean the world. When this virus first came to us, we had no idea how effective it will be in bringing, taking people down as you, as you got infected. It took a number of months and some serious responses in Europe and Eastern North America for us to understand that what we first thought initially that once you were exposed you were in grave danger of 
needing a ventilator and dying. Turns out that a lot of the people who were ending up in that situation were older people and people who had underlying health conditions. So the information that came to us from WHO was watch out, take care of persons who are above a certain age and persons who have underlying health conditions. And we thought then that it may be that those are the ones who were exposed mainly to the virus. Then later on we discovered that if you can protect those people, you really can bring down your casualties considerably. Because what happened in Italy and Spain and the UK in the, in the, in the first few months is not happening now because we understand a bit more of who is exposed. But the important thing is that today, younger people are as exposed as those older people in, in some context. But we also now know that it was the, the percentage you were using in the beginning was 85% like of those who were exposed and deemed positive would literally not get sick. And then we learned later on after a few months that many people who show no symptoms are in fact carrying the virus and could transmit it. All of these were things we learned along the way. We did not learn this at the beginning. So the responses have changed over time. And the same thing happened with how we, how we responded. When we saw the Asians wearing masks, we knew that was their response. And I remember in this very room, one reporter used to wear his mask from day one. And he was literally teased in here when it was not accepted that mask wearing could be a major contributor. In the meantime, a lot of examinations were being done at universities and at government institutions around the world to determine how the virus is being transmitted. And it turned out that those tests were showing that you had droplet transmission, you had aerosols, and of course, how effective those different particles were in uh, affecting populations. And of course, how exposed one had to be to another to be in a good chance of getting the virus. All of these things were being learned along the way. And of course, eventually, we were told that the wearing of masks to restrict the movement of aerosols and droplets are a major part of the response. That is now worldwide. And here in Trinidad and Tobago, as we have done from the very beginning, we took the population into our confidence and said to the people of Trinidad and Tobago, you individual, citizen A, citizen B, citizen Y, citizen Z, you are required to, you are required to do certain things. Because once the virus is in our population, there are certain things that the government will do and must do. Government will close the border, the government will build the, the, the parallel health system, the government will have health caregivers in the wards, the government will support you in very many ways. But in the actual treating with the virus, it is you, the individual, who would have to play that part. So it was always a joint effort. And today we've come to the point where after months of doing this and the population has been responding, we were shut down, we were home for a while, we came back out to work, people have gone back to work, we let certain restrictions and so on. Most people acted responsibly, some chose not to act responsible, responsibly, some chose to become town criers of giving misinformation and encouraging people not to cooperate and so on. We had all of that. All of that we had. And we've come to the point now where one of our main responses is that we ought to be masked once we are interacting with people, whether it is indoors or outdoors. If we wear a mask, we will suppress the movement of droplets and aerosols, and that should be a major contributor. The Asians learned that in the very beginning. Those of us in the Western world did not, at the time they were wearing it, didn't do that here 
we waited until it was confirmed to us that it is playing a significant role. But you still have people telling you it plays playing no role. But the vast majority of the sensible and scientific responses saying to us that if we wear this mask, it will prevent us. And the second thing is, because of this asymptomatic component, that cohort of asymptomatic people in the population, in order to be effectively treating with interpersonal contact, we have to assume that all of us are carrying the virus. And therefore, until you're tested and tested negative, behave as though you are. So don't go mixing up with your elderly family members if you have been out and if you are, in fact, a person who's out and about because you don't know that you are asymptomatic or not asymptomatic and you could then effectively transmit it, which is why we've kept our homes for the aged virtually isolated and to date, if I'm to be corrected, we have not lost any person so far, so far knock wood, in our homes for the aged, which were the places where some countries had catastrophic losses. We, yesterday in the parliament, and um, parliament is meeting now, concluding, the, the Senate is meeting now, concluding the legislation, because we did not find it satisfactory that persons were sufficiently responding to this component of our response, which is the wearing of masks. We talked to you about washing your hands. We talked to you about not touching your face. We couldn't pass any law to tell you don't touch your face and to wash your hands. Those are, those are not things you could pass laws about. You could be, we told you about having sanitizers around and so on. And basically, a very large part of the national population is exposed to that. We stopped certain activities. We made certain withdrawals so as to reduce the number of the population that is exposed at any one time. So all of these are things we've done. We've got a whole panoply of activities in responding to the virus. This mask is, a, is about the last one that we have, late, the latest one. And we expect that from Monday, because if it's passed in the parliament this evening, it will then go through its uh, completion process of assent. And hopefully by Monday, it would be illegal to be out in a public place. Um, Unfortunately, it had to come to this, but we always said that we will do what we had to do to make the appropriate response. Initially, when we said wear a mask, quite a number of persons were, masks weren't, weren't available. We said about to make masks available, and it is now, um, you know, all kinds of masks are available. I'm really intrigued that the styles and stylistical expressions in mask wearing, color coding as we see in media personnel, right? So masks are available. The government has bought and distributed a large amount. There are persons in small business who are selling masks and people are dressing themselves. It is part of your clothing now. And as of Monday, it will be a matter for the police. I heard a member of my, of, of one of my colleagues in the parliament yesterday in using up his parliamentary allocation, making a very big point about how many people the police could lock up and take into the courthouse and so on. But don't pay any attention to that. That is just trying to make argument for argument's sake. Because let's face it, we have a law against speeding. At any given point in time, there are thousands of persons in this country who are speeding. But the police doesn't have the wear it all to charge and lock up everybody who is speeding. But if you are speeding and the police observe you and decide that I will take action against you, the law is there for that. And that is the same context in which the mask is there. If you are not wearing a mask, you may meet many police officers who may not notice, may not observe, but there might be an officer who is saying to you, you're breaking the law, and would make an example of you. Without the law, people were taking the position that I don't have to do that. Well, we are saying to you, yes, you have to. Because it's not just about protecting you, it's about protecting us. And since that is your position, we have made the law such that you will now protect the rest of the population from your irresponsible conduct, which is this country is required, this population is required to respond to this virus by controlling our personal emissions. And of course, inhalations as well, because there is some benefit with respect to inhalations. Because if the, if the virus has to pass through some kind of filter, it's not 100% secure, but 
it can act as a filter. And all the science is telling us, and all the experience is telling us, that we should do it. Um, as we do it this weekend by law, I'm seeing there are a number of other countries who are going this week. Mm -hmm. This week into, the, by the end of this week, this next week actually, today's Saturday, by the end of next week, there are a number of large populations around the world where it would be illegal to be out and about without a mask. And therefore, I will encourage the population of Trinidad and Tobago to let's go down this road that the government is taking us. There will always be minority opinions. If Angel Gabriel come down to Trinidad, somebody going to find fault with his wing. Right? So let us just do what is reasonable. And more importantly, what is we are lucky in that there are people ahead of us in the experience of this. There are larger populations around the world. And we could learn from what works and what doesn't work. And what we are trying to do now is making sure that our original position in responding to this virus, which was we're going to have a parallel health system that will cater for those who are affected. So we don't have to take them into the normal health system because that normal health system is still required to be there for the normal population that is not um, affected by the virus. That system is there and we have to preserve it, as the minister has just told us, with a certain capacity in anticipation. I must tell you, when, before we went on the last um, withdrawal, which is what we are into now, we, we are 14 days into, I think we went about 17th of August thereabouts. Uh, the, uh, um, just before, a, few, a couple of days before that, when the numbers were a little lower, the doctors were telling me that we need to do this because the projections are it's going to do that, it's going to, it's going to run away. I had to be convinced. But I know that the, 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 the position being put to me was not one that was without basis. It wasn't a, a vicarious position. It wasn't, a guess, it wasn't guesswork. It was based on an understanding of the epidemiology and on the pathway, the cycle that the virus would take. And we agreed to do what we did. And of course, I must say that what was projected to happen in fact, did happen. And of course, we are hoping that those projections going forward, if we cooperate with what we are doing in responding, because we did make that response earlier in, the, in, in, our, in August, that what we are predicting now in the curve for the next fortnight, bar general misbehavior, that we should see an improvement on the other side of the, of the curve. So, Basically, we are keeping our parallel health system available, both in Trinidad and Tobago, in the event that we need more hospital space. And in the numbers you heard today, we tell you we are in a good position now with respect to hospital space and uh, step-down step -down facilities. And we are not expecting to eliminate the virus from our population. One of the realities that we are facing now as human beings is that this virus has joined us on this planet and is among populations around the world. What we have to do all along now going forward is be in a position to have the health care and the public health response so that the virus does not overcome us. And that overcoming is measured quickly by an ability or inability to provide health care to those who need it. It is not everybody who tests positive need health care. And it is not everybody who requires health care need it in a high dependency unit. But whatever is required, we must be able to comfortably respond to it. And we think we are in that position going forward. We're not going to be able to step out of it and say, well, okay, it's, it's gone like a hurricane and the next hurricane season is next year. 
right? We are having to manage it, and it is really managing risk. I um, been hearing that a lot of people are expecting today that we will make or maybe we're going to make significant adjustments. I want to tell you that there's no scientific data now which requires us to make any more drastic arrangements, but it does require that we stay, stay on the pathway of the things we said we will do two weeks ago because we wanted a 28-day response. We are in the middle of that 28-day cycle. So today, we will continue with cessation of in-house dining in restaurants and bars and food courts and malls and so on. We will continue with that for another two weeks, as we have said two weeks ago. We will continue to keep our beaches and rivers closed to the public without exemptions. All places of worship would remain closed, but there was a little problem that arose with respect to the interpretation by the police last week, where they were preventing churches from having their small number service, service and broadcasting it to the congregation. We are allowing places of worship to have 10 people spread out in there to allow them to prepare those services which satisfy the needs of the various congregations and devotees. Gyms will remain closed, as we said two weeks ago, and our team sport and contact sports, again, we will cease those for another 14 days. Water parks are to remain closed. Casinos and members' clubs will remain closed. But remember, this we said we'll go until the 28th day, which would be the, the 13th or 14th of September. of September. So we are, all of these things are going to that date. By that time, we will then be able to assess what has happened with the population's response, what has happened with the virus spread, and then by the second week, by the end of the second week of September, we'll be able to visit these things again and see whether we would want to continue roll back, eliminate, as the case might be. Um, cinemas will remain closed. Congregation of personnel will remain at five. Weddings, funerals, ten persons. Mandatory, mandatory wearing of masks. That is the real only addition. As of hopefully by Monday morning, or by, by Monday, the wearing of masks should be mandatory, so between now and Monday, please get your masks and be able to cooperate, and if you have them, be wearing them from now. If you have been wearing them, continue to wear them. If you have not been wearing them and you have not got yourself um, supplied, you have until Monday, because without a mask, you'd be, you'd, be, you'd be required to stay home. I've heard it being said again in the Parliament that poor people can't afford the penalty. Well, the best thing that poor people could do is to put on the mask. And there's no penalty. The penalty is for not putting it on. And I'm sure that in the population now, and by Monday, there will be enough, there are masks around. And if you can't get a mask, what is really required is a covering of your nose and mouth. And I've seen some really creative arrangements. Eh? So let's get serious and have our noses and mouths covered because it is the law, right? Maxi taxis and taxis. The maxi taxis have made an approach to the government indicating in a reasonable way how they could so space people in their taxis to have the population be no more than 65%. And um, we have looked at it, and I will advise the, the Minister of Transport to meet with the Maxi Taxi Association to the, with, with health. Right. But we are minded to allow that 65% in Maxi Taxis. And in taxis, um, 
an arrangement that will allow no, uh, one person per window per vehicle. So if it's a, if it's a four-seater taxi, you can carry three people with each person, um, three passengers, and the driver is the fourth person. And of course, as of Monday, every person in these vehicles would have to be wearing a mask. So that should suppress any movement of the virus. Travel restrictions between Trinidad and Tobago for the next 14 days will remain restricted um, and we'll invite the population only travel if it is absolutely essential because what we are providing there is an essential service. Um, governmental service between Trinidad and Tobago will continue. Public officers will move between Trinidad and Tobago, but the general public only if it's absolutely essential. Let's try and keep the moving public down for the next 14 days. And of course, you would have heard a lot from the Ministry of Education about our teaching institutions, which will remain, as we said two weeks ago, closed. But there's a lot happening with respect to how we respond to our children. So that basically is where we are in the middle of this 28-day period that we asked for last week. And let me say one other thing. I know it makes news to report that somebody is positive for COVID and somebody, has, and, and somebody in our workplace has been exposed to somebody who had COVID. We can't really go on panic living because somebody here that somebody had COVID. Eh? Because we are doing two things. There's life and there's livelihood. We are trying to preserve life by all the things that we are doing with respect to responding to the virus. But in parallel, with a managed component of risk, we are keeping livelihoods going. So we don't want to be shutting down all over the place as a fashion. Only as when it is essential and we respond by however it is done under the guidance of the CMO's office, we do that and we move on, we continue. Unnecessary actions, I, I, got my, I myself got an invitation the other day to a party. I got myself involved, a party if I come early, it's $50, a lot of nice girls. And if you come late, it's $100. I pass that to the police. And I hope that the police would have attended that party and lock up everybody who was there. Because I'm just fed up of people just playing the fool when we are talking about lives and livelihood. And those who have to party, then we have to police them. It's as simple as that. It's as simple as that. Because you see, some people see this as a profitable environment. It is not a profit that is going to work for the wider national community. It is those kinds of gatherings that will cause us to be struggling if we find ourselves unnecessarily infected. And there's one other thing that I didn't mention, and that is that, it's like it's more, probably more than one. We, for the next 14 days, in order to keep the population of moving people lowered, we will put the public service on essential service only for the next 14 days. And that is a major contribution to us uh, trying to get that curve down because having fewer people exposed. So the public service would remain for the next 14 days on essential services only. And of course, um, work at home as directed by the managers of the public service. Um, that would be available and essential staff could also work at home if it is required. Um, we expect to see an increase in the quantum of work at home and teleconferencing with staff and so on because the technology allows us to get that done. It doesn't mean that because we have to stay away from the workplace that we should not get certain work done and we leave that to the managers of the public service to manage the staff in such a way that teleconferencing can allow. Um, in short, what I'm saying is that you're going to be home, but you're not on vacation if you're required to work from home, if you're required to take part in teleconferencing. We're asking for that kind of cooperation 
but we are preventing you from coming out to travel and to mix and to increase the numbers and to share facilities. Those are the kinds of conditions where spread can take place. So we are suppressing that by asking you to disperse yourself and remain in contact technologically. And um, there's a point that I want um, CMO to clarify for you, which is the encouraging all essential services to implement contingency and business. You may want to explain that a bit, CMO, so that there's little confusion as to what that means. Okay, so thank you, Prime Minister. So we are encouraging at this point all essential services to implement their contingency and business continuity plans at this time, for example, or even within our health services, as well as the Electricity um, Commission and WASA, for example. Basically, what we're trying to do is to prevent our essential services from going down if this virus continues to spread. So they are all, I mean, workers, they, they have high-risk environments to start with, and then, of course, they have additional risk at home with community spread. So, for example, what we're trying to do in a health center setting, for instance, we don't want all members of staff to be out at the same time. So you have to have a rotational policy for members of staff so that the entire population, maybe you can do two days on, two days off, a week off, a week on. For, so if someone comes into that environment that is positive or likely to be positive, the entire operation is not closed at the same time. You have persons that can come in and fill that void. We do sanitization in between, which we have seen happen with a lot of private sector enterprises over the course of this epidemic already. We want that to be a priority now, and it needs to be implemented as soon as possible, if, if not already, for the essential services to ensure that there's business con continuity across the board. Another example we have, Dr. Rahman would have speak, uh, spoken about a few weeks well uh, regarding, for instance, manufacturing plants, where you have large areas, persons working together. We want to spatially segregate those individuals. So maybe you have 20 persons working together in a, a sort of group, and you split that workforce of 100 into five groups, so that if a person becomes positive in one group, there's no co-mingling. And that means during their break time and everything else, so that there are people available to continue the business processes across the board. So those plans, private sector, public sector, needs to be implemented and started now, because the way we have seen spread um, take root in our public sector, for instance, even within the Ministry of Health, we would have had three divisions go down over the last couple of weeks, with entire units having to stay home for 14-day quarantine. So we expect that those plans are put in place and actioned immediately to avoid and to ensure that we have continuity across the sectors. Thank you, CMO. What, in effect, you just heard is us living with the virus until there's a vaccine. Because we have to get on with our livelihoods and our lives, but the exposure is always going to be there because the virus is here with us. And until there's a vaccine that um, is available across the board, these are the conditions that we are coming up with to suppress and coexist with the microbe. That's as much as I want to say now, and if there are questions that you have, we'll take your questions now. All right, okay. But I'm sure the questions will be the questions that are Okay. Um, with the mandatory wearing of masks coming on stream soon, um, what is the, the reason behind keeping the numbers small in terms of gatherings and whatnot, if everybody will be mandated to wear masks? So, so man, mask alone is, is a singular public health intervention, okay? So mask by itself cannot stop the spread of any virus. You have to have all the public health measures that we have been saying all along working in tandem, and they do work synergistically. So one supports the next. Social distancing, hand washing, mask wearing, all support each other to bring the chance of contracting a virus lower and lower and lower if you do more of them together. So we want to dissuade gathering in addition to wearing masks. So if you have a number of people in a room very close together wearing masks, the transmission potential is slightly greater, is greater, much greater, than if you have the same amount of people wearing masks and social distancing. 
So we have to do all of them together in order to control this virus. This is CMO of the day, Crystal mm -hmm. Wilson, TTT Limited. My question is concerning um, patients who have tested positive for the virus. I understand that there are a number of uh, kidney patients. Right. Uh, earlier, I think it was mentioned that dialysis will continue for these patients. My understanding is that there's just one machine. Is it affecting uh, the treatment of all the patients currently in the system? Right, so the, the, that has been discussed with the Chiefs of Staff of the various hospitals to ensure, I think it is a human resource issue that is being worked out through the offices of the various chief executive officers. They do have staff at the different RHAs, which they will pull together a pool of persons so that we can op optimize the machines that are required, at least at the Coover facility in the first instance. And then going forward, if there's need to have separate pools of machines as the numbers continue to increase, they will, do, they will put that in place. But the CEOs are working on a solution together with the chiefs of staff. My other question is for the Minister of National Security, if you mm -hmm. sure. should be so committed. And it seems to, well, at least to those of us that know, that as long as people go into that ICU um, stage, that the prospects are dead. Can you tell us whether there has been, there have been any cases of people who have gone into ICU and come out of it alive? Yeah, so there have been many cases that persons would have gone into ICU and been stepped back down to HDU and then, of course, to the wards and back home. Um, I think even in the early days, we would have had a few cases where people went into ICU and then came out. Our death rate in Trinidad, as of today, is 1.2%. Um, globally, it's somewhere between 2 and 5 percent, closer to 3 percent, if you look at all countries. So the death rate in Trinidad is actually um, very low at this point. Again, our sample size is 1,577 for now. So we take the total number of deaths and divide that by the, the total number of positive cases that we have. And that is based on confirmed cases. If you look at suspected cases that may be there that would not have tested positive, it goes down even further. So the death rate is in Trinidad so far. Um, and we, we hope that the trend continues very good, 1.2%. Um, and for the most part, it has been in the elderly and persons with comorbidities. The, I just want to speak to the persons that are at home. We have quite a large number of people now at home and nursing themselves in mild conditions. The ones that need to be, we need to bring into hospital are the ones that really have comorbidities, meaning diabetes, hypertension, definitely persons above 60 with those conditions as well. Those are the people that we want to bring into hospital, have a close look at, and they step down. But critically, what we want people not to do is stay at home and have worsening of your symptoms. If you have shortness of breath, you have any other signs, vomiting, persistent diarrhea, feeling extremely weak and tired, either call the EHS, call the CMOHs that have been in contact with you, or come straight into a facility, don't wait, because it is a virus that can go from a very mild symptomatology to escalating within the space of hours. So, and that is why we have instituted monitoring and evaluation through the CMOH twice a day. Um, and we are in the process of getting some objective pulse oximeters out to these patients, hopefully by next week, so that we can actually tell their oxygen saturation level at home, as well as their pulses. So we're trying to get those out to the house, households with positive people, so we can objectively see if there's a decline in your, your oxygen saturation, which is a very good objective clinical measure to tell you if there's decompensation. And those are the people we want to bring in quickly if we're seeing that change. Can you tell us how many of the vaccine boards, yeah. if any, involve people who had no comorbidities? I believe there would have been two persons that, that weren't listed on the form when we first categorized it. But again, sometimes when persons come in later on, it's difficult to get up a history from those individuals. So there were two persons that I could recall out of the 19 that didn't have a listed diagnosis of diabetes or hypertension or anything else that I could find. Dr. Trotman, that's correct? Yeah. So, so far, that's, that's how many I have. Mm -hmm. um, there was some concern with regards to LAD right. um, for results. Has that been rectified? Because there are still people complaining that they've been correct, working yeah. too long for So we have been working through the director of the Trinidad Public Health Lab. Um, we have additional staff at the Ministry of Health, Dr. Smith, 
and as well as trying to have some private sector engagement. There's two things. Is as the tests continue to come in, the test really the number of swabs that we do today surpasses the, the capacity of the lab. So until we can either get our capacity back up beyond the number of swabs coming in or the number of swabs drops below the hour capacity, there will still always be a little backlog. Um, as the number of cases decrease, um, reciprocally there should be a decrease in the number of swabs occurring as well. So it is a process that is ongoing. We're trying to continuously build the capacity out in the lab to, to push through more tests per day to deal with that backlog. But the backlog has improved in terms of the turnaround time at the Trinidad Public Health Lab for in particular with only a few days for actually performing the test. Understandably, the Trinidad Public Health Lab has actually, over the course of 20 years, been able to turn around tests on average from the time the sample is taken back to the lab. Not, this is not COVID-19 alone. This is COVID-19, HIV, VDRL, whatever is taken within about a week. A week to 10 days is the average turnaround for any test taken at an institution and having to go back to the clinicians. So it is sort of par for the course. However, we are trying to get it a little better for, and it has been improving for severe cases in the hospital. So those people that are very ill, we're using something called a gene expert machine which could turn you around in about 45 minutes. So for the severely ill ones, we have, our turnaround is very fast. Persons with milder illnesses, we, it, it goes through the process, has to go to a physician, and the physician has to inform the person of the results. So it goes to about five, five to seven days for that whole process to go through. The lab component takes about 48 hours to 72 hours out of that whole process. So there has been some improvement, and we continue to increase the capacity at the lab, but it is a process and I just want to add, um, in terms of testing, for the Trinidad Public Health Lab for the month of August, the director has indicated to me that the number of samples and tests that they have run in August alone surpasses the annual number of tests that they would have done in the whole of 2019. Just to give you an idea of the capacity we're trying to build in a short period of time. Do you have any ideas the number we have in the backlog, 20, 50 cases? I, I don't want to put a number to it. Just to give you an average, we have about 700 to 800 samples being taken every day. Our capacity as of today is roughly about 600, so there is a little sur surplus still. So that's just to give you an idea of the capacity of the system. We are using private sector to build out a little additional capacity, but again, they have private sector work as well that they do. So we can't tell them how many tests to do per day, but they're trying to accommodate as best as they can. MRF. Yeah, so MRF is one of the other um, medical research foundation that we have leaned on, and they have been able to turn around quite a large number of tests they did five, over 500 tests for us in less than 48 hours, and we just gave them another batch this morning. So MRF is really helping us to turn that number again. But again, once the numbers keep maintaining that high input, it is extremely difficult to, to, to push it back out as quickly as we would like. Another question for yeah. So in this second wave, as opposed to the first wave, as I said, the 55.5% was the average age in the phase one. Um, the average age about two weeks ago was 33 or thereabouts. It has gone up a little bit um, to somewhere in the 40s. So the average age has dropped in terms of the infection. And I suppose um, concurrently, there have been a decrease in the mortality rate because, of course, as you know, as you get older, there's a higher level of mortality. So it is a function of age as well in terms of the infections tend to be milder in the, in the younger age groups. And how do you differentiate between the active cases and I, I, I've noticed a change in the listing. We no longer have recovered. We have active sure. and discharged. Right. Um, there is some concern that there would be a false sense of security when we see the people who have gone home being listed as discharged and they are not recovered stats anymore. Right, so active cases basically means all the positive cases that we have at this point in time who has not met the discharge criteria as I discussed it before. Recovered persons would be persons that were discharged based on that criteria. So those are all the recovered individuals. So that's how we define it. So recovered and discharged is almost used inter interchangeably. Yeah, well, I understand mm -hmm. that there's a, a flight to Barbados tomorrow. I understand some students are due to return. I also understand that Barbados has changed their policy somewhat um, concerning um, persons not landing unless they have a negative test. So, Minister Young, I believe, lands. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, this is something that we've become aware of within the last 24 hours, and it really is irrelevant because it is a requirement of the Barbadian government. So they have implemented a necessity for certain test results. 
when we put together these two flights, so one left today, we had, no, yesterday, we had a flight on Friday to Barbados, a full plane going up to Barbados, and we had put on another full one tomorrow on Sunday. So within the last 24 hours, now we're being asked that Barbados has changed their requirements. There's nothing we can do because it's not a requirement of the Trinidad government. So people will have to meet those requirements. Who can't meet it? I guess they can't get into Barbados, and, and that's just how we'll have to deal with it. Was that the question you wanted to do? has to deal with bars and the gatherings outside now. Have you yes. had any feedback from the police concerning their, their um, watch? You know, so and? yesterday being Friday, that was a discussion with Trinidad and Tobago Police Service. So we put in place the commissioner of police after discussion, put in place instructions to all of the divisions, asking them to focus their patrols on it. I too did some observation, but we asked, as the regulations stand, you're not allowed to serve the drinks inside. You're not allowed to consume them within the precincts or the, the premises or the precincts. And we asked the police officers to make sure and enforce that. During the course of the night, you're still getting reports. And from all over Trinidad of persons saying, look, there's still some bars. Unfortunately, some bars still want to close their doors and allow people to watch the CPL games and other things internally. So the police are doing what they can to enforce it. They still have the 555 number to be able to enforce it. We ask persons to notify us, but really it's for persons to just be responsible. And what I have asked as a policy decision of the government is make some examples. So shut down some of the bars. You can charge some of the bar owners for eating or betting on it if they're going to have that encouraged in their, their premises, certainly if there's an activity in the bar, but even the persons on the outside, you, you're allowed to charge persons on the outside. So we've asked the TTPS to make some examples if persons are going to behave badly. Okay, Prime Minister, there's one question we've been bombarded with, which is to do with the mandatory mask wearing. A lot of people have been asking, do I still have to wear my mask in my personal car as I'm driving? The answer is it is going to be very difficult to police if you are family, if persons are in a PH car. If it's one person in a vehicle, then I think you, you wouldn't be charged for one person in a vehicle not wearing a mask. But we're asking, even with families, please wear the mask because it is going to be difficult from an enforcement point of view, especially, for example, we're all familiar with PH PH drivers, so they're not going to have an H as a taxi, and when we pull those vehicles aside for them to see their family, so please continue to wear your mask. If it's one person in a vehicle, I guess that is, um, the CMO will allow us that indulgence, but once it's more than that, please wear your mask. How, how would you um, police the mask wearing for people like vagrants, for homeless people? <laughs> <laughs> what, 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 what do you mean? <laughs> Well, there will be one group that will be all over. So we know that they'll be spreading anything that they have. The, the socially displaced, um, what's, the, what's the correct term for that? Socially displaced. Yeah, they, they would require attention in a, in, a, in a slightly different way because if you, if you provide them with a mask and they don't put it on or you put it on they take it off, you just, just got to work with the situation. The one thing we don't want and, and, and again, as a national population, we really don't want to be having to be trips into the court, carrying people to the court to be adjudicated upon because they didn't wear a mask. Everybody in this country has an opinion. Everybody in this country has an opinion to express. Everybody in this country knows who's not doing their work. Everybody in this country knows who should be held accountable for something. We want to use that same enthusiasm in the personal use of the mask on your own face and your minor children, if it comes to that. Just, 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 just understand that if some people are not doing it, it makes the whole thing ineffective. And to not do it, because whatever the reason, you're just putting the rest of the country through unnecessary stress. Even if you don't believe that it's going to work, it has worked elsewhere. Others are saying it's going to work. Don't get yourself charged for not complying deliberately. You know, that, that, that's, that's uh, what more can we do? Right? You know, there are other societies 
where the instruction to do this, there's no pushback. Mm -hmm. We always compare ourselves to Singapore. We're supposed to be like Singapore in our economic development. We're supposed to be like Singapore in our governmental management. But what happens in Singapore does not happen in Trinidad and Tobago. The government in Singapore has a certain amount of leeway and gets a certain amount of response from the population. In Korea, in China, right, and even, even in Europe, and now in, in certain aspects in the United States. Yesterday in the parliament, I, again, I had to sit down there and listen to one of my colleagues talking about the power we give to the minister to make regulations, to make you wear masks. If you don't give the power to an officer of state, who is going to be responsible? And of course, the same person who is saying that is holding the minister responsible for every confirmed COVID case. I have actually seen it said by a person in this country who is a politician that I allow COVID to come in this country. And now we are saying that certain officers are responsible to do certain things to ensure that the population is protected. You have to listen to all kind of full, full argument about giving the minister authority. In some, some, some parts of the United States, the governor has the authority to do it without going to any legislative chamber. As a governmental authority, the governor makes the authority. In some places, it's the mayor who is doing it and saying we want this done. In some places, the law is enforced in a way that we here would think is draconian. So in our society, we try to make the laws and we try to make the regulations and we try to make the exhortations in such a way that we, we understand our society and we simply cannot do this alone. It's not a governmental thing. That's the point I'm making. This is not going to be and is never going to be a governmental thing. It's a responsible population that will protect itself from a surprise attack that's been going on now for eight months. And it could go on very disastrously if we don't respond in the way we've been guided by our healthcare givers. So the conversation is, is, is it sounds good for some people to be talking all kinds of things about what should and shouldn't and who should and shouldn't. The one thing we got to focus on, what are you doing at the personal level? Because that's what matters. With respect to the border closure, next week I'm going to have a um, meeting with the Ministry of National Security and we are going to maximize the amount of exemptions granted. The transportation system is another story because borders are closed and there's no scheduled transport. But given where we are now and with the use of home quarantine and so on, our case to keep people outside has been considerably reduced and we will grant the exemptions in a much uh, more liberal way and persons will come home and when they arrive here, the CMO, if they have, you know, cons if they have concerns, the CMO will manage that because he's managing the population at large. So we really need, after eight months, we really need to close this chapter, you know, in a more effective way. So those persons who've been on the outside, been very patient. We need to bring them home as quickly as we can, but we do have transportation issues. Even when we grant the exemptions, there are still going to be issues of how they get here. And of course, in so far as cooperating in arranging the kinds of transport that we've been arranging there recently, to take the children out, bring them back from university and so on, we will work that with the objective being to get as many people who are domiciled in Trinidad and Tobago. Those are our primary concern right now. People who live here, who went outside and couldn't get back home. We need to try and get them back home now in as quickly a way as we can. Returning nationals will be allowed to home quarantine. Returning nationals. Yes. Persons who live, who claim Trinidad and Tobago as their home and who were caught outside by the closure of the border. After eight months now, we think we should make every attempt to bring them within the border, and the CMO will guide us as to how we do that. Right? Well, we, the, the, we're not, we haven't reached there yet, but I, I, I'm, um, I, I don't see people coming home. Uh, now that we've moved to home quarantine, if people before, if you come in, you had to go into quarantine, because that was all that was available, the mandatory quarantine. Now that the mandatory quarantine is not available, 
we have to determine what happens to these people when they come home, right? If, especially if they come and we test. And we have more space. If we have more space and we, our testing capacity is improved and we will then be able. But um, this is, uh, I'm just giving here the health department far more work to do. But I think we really must get people home. Are there, any plans? Sorry, are there any plans to have mask sanitizing of public spaces or is that ongoing? And um, one other question, um, we uh, have already mass sanitization of, of the promenade, bus terminals, these, these places, or, or no? And we have already been bombarded with calls to the newsroom concerning the flights that people are unable to make tomorrow because of um, them not having negative tests. They're asking whether but or not they have any recourse. The minister just said that has nothing to do with this government. It is a condition laid down by the government of Barbados. So the traveler and the government, we all caught in the same position. The point of departure of, of disembarkation have changed the terms of disembarking. Barbados have put arrangements in place, and um, we just have to now rework the movements. If, we are, if you were supposed to go and you can't meet the conditions to land in Barbados, well, then we just have to work for the next opportunity. Crystal, Crystal, let me just let me just clarify that thing with Barbados. If you looked at the England example recently, every country is taking decisions at very short notice. England took a decision that any person coming back into England had to quarantine for 14 days. That caught English citizens returning from Spain on a plane coming in. They left Spain not knowing that they had to quarantine. In the air, England took a decision. When they landed, they now had to quarantine. The point I'm trying to make, all countries make these decisions to protect their populations, and we have to live with it. From the CMO, the safeguards that are taken when people are given the privilege of quarantining. Um, to me, I'm wondering if people should be given information. And when I say people, I mean the general public should be given information because there seems to be nothing that compels these people to adhere or to, nothing that compels them to remain in a bubble like the CPL players because people know who the CPL players are there in a bubble. If you are in a, at your home quarantining, there is nothing that compels you to stay there, not to go out to whatever. No, that, what that, that's not correct, Uriah. <laughs> what compels you to stay there is a contract between you and the rest of the population. That if you come out, yeah. you are going to be penalized. Everybody has a knife in their house. There's nothing that compels you not to use the knife to kill somebody. But if you do that, there are certain consequences. It is the <laughs> consequence that compels you to stay there. So, so, so they, are, they are being given, everyone who is put into home quarantine is being given a quarantine order to stay there by the CMOH offices for the duration of time that we think it takes for someone to become and meet the discharge criteria non-infective. So they are being given a, a legal letter in writing, every single person that is positive. If they breach the quarantine, of course, that is enforcement by the TTPS. However, we have taken up a decision in-house that if someone, the CMH, can't, tries to contact you, you have, we have good cause to believe that you are not at home, we will take the decision to take you into a state facility and quarantine you there instead, and you will be charged under the full um, ambit of the law, and there's a fee of 6000 that can be assigned to you, as well as being confined in state quarantine. And, and Andrea, you saw it work in Tobago recently. Is there a case for letting the population know who or where these people are so that people can take action in the same way as was done, you know, that the population protected itself because of the information provided? That brings me to another point, and the point is this. The population ought not to take this position that persons who are COVID positive are to be 
treated in any in any way um, with scorn. This is a condition where we are saying all of us have to assume that we are participants in the transmission of the virus. What happened in a Caribbean territory here close to us very early in the game when we were managing this, the very fact that a confirmed case was reported from a hotel, members of the public started to treat the people who were working in the hotel as people to be scorned and they were being denied access to public transportation and so on and so on. We have to treat people who you may know or suspect have become COVID positive as normal citizens fighting the virus that we are fighting too. And that having been said, if that is the condition, then if you know somebody who is supposed to be at home to protect all of us, and the person is parading up and down the place, call the police. It's as simple as that. You can't have it both ways. Eh? Well, how we know, we, we, the public information comes by a variety of ways, right? But the bottom line is, we are saying to you, don't treat people as having an ailment that causes you to treat them with scorn. They are normal citizens who, like everybody else, is fighting the virus. The positive confirmation is a condition which will go, which is being treated, which all of us, right, even the very one who would treat the person in an offhand manner, might even be a person who's an asymptomatic carrier. So we appeal to the public not to take that position with anybody or any family or any, or any community because we, we, we have had complaints or we've had seen stories about people wanting to know who, I mean, in one community recently there was a confirmed person at a school and there was some serious social pushback there and, um, you know, children were treated in a particular way, families were treated in a particular way. We are asking that that not be done. Right? If people are sick, it's an ailment, and every one of us is exposed to it, so there's no point in taking the position that they're sick and you're healthy. But having said that, if you, if you know that someone is supposed to be in quarantine, then that is part of our, of our process. You are supposed to be keeping away from the population. Don't come out and parade, because if you do that, that is an act of lack of cooperation. So let's all cooperate in that way. And if you know somebody who is not cooperating by coming out when they're supposed to be on quarantine, then by all means, report them to the authorities. Allow me to be devil's advocate for just a little bit. Um, could you define home um, in the context of people living in apartment complexes? Um, would they be allowed to go outside? Home is the area place? that you're responsible for. If you're living in an apartment complex, you're in, a, you're in an apartment, one of the apartments, that is your home, that's what you're responsible for. And if you're supposed to be quarantined at home, it means in your home. It doesn't mean on the compound, running up and down the corridors of an apartment block. You're not at home. So if the phone rings from the CMO's office and you can't answer the phone because you're not in the apartment, well, of course, cell phone, wherever you are, the phone is with you. But the bottom line is, home is the area of your domicile where you are responsible for. So if you're in a compound, in a gated community, your home is this number, whatever your number is, that's your home. Not the community and say, well, look, I'm outside out there. That's what the quarantine is about, keeping you isolated. And PM, if, if you allow me, that's why when I started, I said we have made the refinement now that persons who live in conditions like apartments who cannot properly self-isolate self-quarantine, we are now offering them the voluntary option come into state quarantine because we understand you don't have more than two or three bathrooms in your house, it's one bedroom, and that will take care of that type of question, apartment living, crowded ho houses, and so on. So that is exactly why we have added that refinement to the policy. Come in to state quarantine, no charge, and serve out your quarantine period. Okay? Uh, Mr. Or Prime Minister, um, 
you stress Prime Minister that there will be no exemptions for beaches and rivers and whatnot. What about for religious functions? Um, there's one coming up on Tuesday, I believe. Ganesh Tutsava. I hope I pronounce it properly. Um, would that be allowed? We are in a pandemic and we have taken certain decisions that apply across the board. We did not have, at the end of March, we had Baptist Liberation Day, and all kinds of things were planned, and all had to be canceled for the simple reason that we could not encourage congregation of people for whatever purpose. So that's as and, far as it goes. And this is not to penalize anyone. Let's, let's go back. We had Eid during the pandemic. Um, we had no gatherings. You had Easter. You had Corpus Christi. So this, is, this applies across the board because we don't want it to be said we are penalizing any one person or one group. We are in a pandemic. But in all fairness, the Eid and, and these other things, they were allowed inside the temples and the mosques and the churches and live stream with, with no, sir. no, sir. No, sir. No gatherings are allowed. We are in a global pandemic with 24, 25 million cases globally, sir. I could, Everyone has I to put their weight. I could tell you, um, we had a number of functions organized, not just planned, but organized for Baptist Liberation Day. And every one of them was canceled. And you, you should understand this. What, what are we doing all of this for? We're doing all of this to prevent a virus moving from one person to another. So any situation that allows that bridge to be available, gathering, that's why we said no contact sport, no team sport, right? Thousands of young people desperate to go out there and play team sport for all kinds of reasons. But because the condition under which they'll be operating would be one that is conducive to the virus, being spread from one person to the other, regardless of how important the fixture is, we have had to say no for the time being. And I mean, what, look at going to church. I mean, what better um, way of spending your time than going to church? We've said, as important as that is, as spiritual as that is, as safe as inside the church is, don't come because when you gather there, the virus can be spread from one person to another. That is why, that's the only reason why you said no gathering in places of worship. We have nothing against people worshiping their gods, but coming together to do it provides an environment that could lead us to be um, having the virus, you know, taking, becoming an overwhelming factor in our lives. That's as simple as that. So exemptions, when I said no exemption, I wasn't pointing at any particular person or any particular event. We're saying that we, for the period that we are aiming to bring those numbers down, we only do that if we do it completely. Because if some people do it and others don't do it, then you don't get the benefit of what we're trying to do. And of course, I know there's always people who can make a case for themselves. But we're not dealing with this at the personal level, or otherwise we are going to end up making, taking part measures where we can take whole measures. Well, it's a good thing that the beach is closed. Eh? You could imagine what, you, you could imagine what was going to happen between Friday and Tuesday if we hadn't got the beaches closed. But again, there are those who will think that that's we should keep the beaches open for them to go and have a good time. But what is likely to happen 14 days after that good time? And we, we carrying this fear that if we find ourselves in this situation where we have so many sick people that our health infrastructure cannot respond appropriately, that is when we know we're in trouble. Not listening to the complaints of the few who saying I should be allowed to continue my life as normal. It is not normal. And that brings me to the point I think we should end on a note where I should wish the national community uh, safe, happy, and reflective independence. Last year when we spoke of independence, the last thing that was on our mind, if at all, was being in this situation. In eight months, what a difference eight months has made to us. 
So I am appealing to you to reflect on our independence. We are responsible for our circumstance. Nobody is responsible for us. And in this matter, at the personal level, if we are responsible, hopefully by our 59th anniversary of independence, we look back on this period as a period of great difficulty, which we have overcome with aplomb, because we are the people of Trinidad and Tobago, and we are to manage and handle our stories good enough to come out of it together successfully. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much.